good to go to, to take off here. Um, all right, everybody. Um, my name is Jay Keck, and um, I'm kind of addicted to birds and bird sounds. Um, it's uh, kind of crazy how much joy uh, these birds uh, bring me, and this time of year is fantastic. You know, we have birds here uh, every single day of the year, but boy, right now, uh, there's more color out here now than there will be at any other time during the year. You know, we have a lot of birds coming through um, to, to pass through South Carolina to go further north to breed. Um, so that brings us a lot of color and a lot of sounds. Uh, but then we also have birds that are coming here to, uh, to breed in South Carolina, just like these three birds that y'all should see on your, on your screen right now, the black and white warbler, the scarlet tanager, and the Orthonotary warbler. All three of those species will breed in South Carolina. Um, so I'm going to play. I mean, this uh, this whole pre presentation is about sound um, and um, identifying birds by sound. Uh, just enjoying it. Um, it can be a little overwhelming, as uh, as you'll see whenever I play this uh, this audio here. Um, but listen, okay, and listen closely to this audio and see how many bird species y'all can pick out. Um, there's either four, six, or nine. Y'all, uh, y'all see if you can, y'all see if you can pick, uh, pick the correct answer here. But let's listen. It's about a minute long, so um, I'm gonna stop talking here and uh, just want everybody to uh, listen and, and see, uh, see what they hear. And I appreciate y'all, uh, y'all joining us. Let's get started. And don't include the uh, my son that was in that got caught in the in the end of that audio. Um, but are any uh, are any answers coming in? Do you think there are four bird species that were not saying? yet? Let's see. Um, right. a four six a lot of fours, couple sixes. No nines, huh? We did get one nine. Ooh, one nine. Um, you know, I'll, uh, I guess, you know, the, the one with the nine got the closest. I actually heard one more in there while I was listening nice and quietly, uh, that I forgot about. So the correct answer is seven, unless, uh, somebody has better hearing than, than <laughs> I do. And, and they picked out another one. So um, trick question. Go ahead. <laughs> it's a trick question. Oh yeah, <laughs> right. The answer wasn't even on there. Um, but there was a chipping sparrow on there, a Carolina wren, a chickadee, Carolina chickadee. Uh, there was a northern perula. Um, there was a tufted titmouse. There was a brown-headed nuthatch, and then there was also a blue-gray gnatcatcher. So uh, the blue-gray gnatcatcher is the one that I that no, it was the northern perula that I uh, had forgot about, um, and I heard it again today. So, um, so there's actually seven. Um, but uh, you know, it, it, it's kind of overwhelming whenever whenever you hear. Um, you know, I guess the best word is a cacophony of of, of sounds like that. Um, and that was just right here in my backyard in in Chapin. Um, and you know, just just think about three acres that we have here. Not not even. Um, we've had around 100, and I think 106 bird species uh, just just right here in the backyard. So think about all those sounds, those different sounds. Um, and it, and it takes some practice. Uh, you're going to make mistakes. I do. Um, everybody does. And uh, you learn from them, and you get better, and you have more fun whenever you're out there. So. Um, I'm going to go to the next slide here, and I'm going to show you a little video that I took this weekend when we were out in Abbeville. Oh, Gigi, what do you hear again? I hear birds going, dibby doo, dibby doo, dibby doo. Okay, and I think that's the common yellow footed warbler that uh, I just showed you a picture of just a second ago. And Selma, which uh, bird do you hear? Um, it sounds like this. Cheetah, 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 cheetah. Ooh, we're gonna have to go find that one, okay? Does that sound good? Yes. 
All right. Those are some cute girls right there. Um, so we were in Abbeville camping this weekend, and uh, you see the boy in the back. Uh, by the end of the weekend, he was able to, to ID summer tanagers by, uh, by sight. Uh, they were so close, he, he didn't even need binoculars. Um, but, you know, I don't know if you heard it, but there was a uh, common yellowthroat um, a warbler in the background there, and uh, we just couldn't, couldn't quite find him, and he was, he was staying pretty still, so we never saw him. Um, but, uh, you know, they could hear him. So she said, did a do, did a do, did a do, right? And that's her interpretation of it. But typically when you read about the common yellow throat, you hear the word or the words, witchity, 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 um, which could be confused with tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle, right? And that's the Carolina wren or Germany, Germany, Germany for the Carolina wren. So, you know, there's some similarities. Um, and then the cheetah, 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 I'm not sure exactly what the what the youngest one there um, was hearing, but it could have been a, maybe a tufted titmouse, maybe a, a Carolina wren, or maybe that was her interpretation of the uh, common yellowthroat warbler. Um, so, you know, my point, you know, of, of playing that, I guess, is everybody's going to have their own, you know, interpretation of uh, these sounds and these mnemonics that that we can use to help identify these birds. Um, you know, the, the, there's just a great cartoon right here with uh, with the various um, mnemonics that we can use. Um, you know, you see the oven bird, which is on the right hand side at the second one down. It says teacher, teacher. What I would say also is that it crescendos. Um, it gets louder and louder, and it's uh, it's a bird that's here right now. If you're in the right habitat, if you're uh, you, you're in a you're in a big forest, um, and maybe maybe at some edges there, uh, but if you go to Harbison State Forest, assuming that it's still open, um, you know, that's a, uh, that's a fantastic place to go see an oven bird if you've never seen one. And then we have drink your tea um, is a mnemonic, a favorite one of the Eastern Toei. Um, yeah, I mean, they kind of get funny, sweet, sweet, I'm so very sweet by the lip yellow warbler. Um, and some of them are just buzzes, uh, like the bee buzz of the blue wing warbler at the bottom left corner. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, sounds out there, and this is just, uh, what, 12 of them right here. Um, and again, remember, uh, I, in just my yard, I've had over 100 birds, so think about all those sounds. And then in South Carolina, I think, uh, in, the, in the history that we've been keeping track with birds, we've got around a, a little over 400 species. So <laughs> think about all those songs that are out there to learn and sounds. Uh, so we're not going to get to all 400 today. Um, we're just going to kind of scratch the surface. Um, but let's uh, practice some common backyard bird sounds here. We'll uh, start with the cardinal and then go over to the Carolina chickadee and then get to the tufted titmouse. And here we go. So the, uh, the female and the male are um, uh, both saying, um, I put the female up here because I think she's beautiful and uh, a lot of times the female birds don't get much love. So I figured I'd uh, include a picture of one of the female birds. Um, but that's a, uh, you know, a lot of people will say it sounds like a gun in Star Wars, a, a laser gun. Um, and see if you can kind of see if that makes sense in your, in your mind right now whenever I play it again. Right there. Bird that could, I guess, get you, you could get that confused with would, would be a tufted titmouse. The, the, the pitch and the tone are, are about the same, but there are some um, uh, differences, and we'll play those here in just a second. Well, I might as well go ahead and play that one now. Here we go with a tufted titmouse, another common backyard bird, especially if you have a feeder. A lot of times people say, Peter, Peter, Peter. And then we will close this one out with a Carolina chickadee. And you know, when you think about a chickadee, all, all uh, well, no, two out of the three are cavity nesters. The Carolina chickadee is a cavity nester, a tufted titmouse is a cavity nester, and then the Northern Cardinal will make a nest in a pretty thick area. Um, found one in the um, in the grapevines, the, the the native grapevines that we have growing around here. Um, but uh, if you know, most people think about putting up a bluebird house, and that's fantastic. Um, but also think about you know maybe putting another one up. Um, 
uh, for the Carolina chickadee. You think about chickadees, they're a species in decline um, and a tufted titmouse as well. Um, you, can, you can put a box up for them. Um, so if you have the property for it, your, your yard's big enough, um, you, you might just want to go ahead and throw a second box up and see if you can uh, help one of those species out. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to spend too much time on these just because um, I would imagine most of us um, have heard those before um, and I'm pretty familiar with them. But if you, if you ever have any questions about those, you can always reach out to me. Um, here, let's go to one of my favorite species here. It's a, they're vireos. Um, and one of the ways that you can um, kind of identify them by, by ear is using their name, which is vireo, vireo, vireo. But uh, this little phrase right here, here I am. Where are you? Over here in a tree. Um, so it sounds like, uh, you know, a lot of people I've heard say it sounds like they ask a question and then answer it. So um, see if you can hear that with the red eyed vireo. And all three of these are here right now. The blue headed vireo is a bird that we get uh, in the winter. So it starts showing up in the fall. But um, I heard one yesterday. Um, in a post oak tree that's in the backyard and was able to find it. And uh, I mean, it is one of the most spectacular birds that we have here, in my opinion. I mean, it's got a, the steely blue head with these fantastic white spectacles, the yellow wash that you can see on the side, on the flanks of the bird, wing bars, just that beautiful white. I mean, it is really a stunning bird. And if I would have not, if, if I hadn't heard that bird, I would have never seen it because um, the bird was pretty still at that time, but it was singing. And uh, obviously that cued me in that there was a blue headed vireo there. Um, and uh, I was able to, to enjoy that bird. Um, and here, let, we'll start with the red eyed vireo though, which is a bird. Hey, that Yep. To interrupt real quick, we do have a quick question. What is the recommended hole size for a bird box for a chickadee? Um, you know, the the uh, bluebird is a is a inch and a half, and I actually have a chickadee um, using my bluebird box right now. Um, you could probably go to an inch and a quarter. Um, I know I have something in my brown headed nut hatch box right now, and that hole is an inch. Um, wide. So I don't know if it's a chickadee or if it is actually a brown headed nut hatch. I've seen the nest, um, but so far no eggs. And I haven't, uh, I don't know why, but I just haven't been lucky enough to uh, get, get a glimpse of the bird that's making the nest. Um, you can also go to nestwatch.org, nestwatch.org, and um, you can, they'll, they'll have the dimensions for uh, those each of those species um, or a lot of the species that we're talking about today um, but uh, I do know that they can they can use a hole that's smaller than an inch and a half they're, they're quite a bit smaller than a bluebird um, and when you when you cut that size down you're going to prevent a bluebird from using it so if you want to attract a chickadee you know I would I would go a little bit smaller than a than an inch and a inch and a half maybe an inch and a quarter I, I don't know if you can get away with an inch but you might but nestwatch.org will have the answer for you um, and here look what's that that sounds good Okay, all right. So let's go into the vireos here, and you're going to hear some similarities, but I'm going to point out some differences. So let's listen to the red eyed vireo. Okay, so listen to how fast that is um, compared to the blue headed vireo. All right, so let's listen to the blue headed vireo. We just listened to the red eyed vireo. All right, I'm just gonna stop that for a second. So, you know, to me, it sounds like the blue headed vireo is a little shy, like it doesn't really wanna sing, but it knows it has to. Um, whereas the red eyed vireo just had way too much coffee in the morning and just can't, um, you know, uh, be quiet. <laughs> um, so, you know, the red eyed vireo is really confident, really wants to sing and wants to uh, let everybody know that he's there. And let's listen to the blue headed vireo again. Uh, to me, it's a little bit crisper. Um, it's a little bit more uh, intentional. It sounds like he's like, okay, I'm going to sing. So he goes, vireo. And then he waits a little bit and he's like, okay, I'm going to sing again, vireo. So let's listen to this blue headed vireo. Okay, now I want to go back to the red eyed vireo so y'all could see the difference or hear the difference. I'm sorry.
a lot faster, right? Um, sometimes the, the blue head of area will speed it up a little bit. I, I haven't really heard one in the last few years uh, sound as quick as a red eyed vireo, but you can even tell in the pitch um, or the clarity, it, it is a little bit clearer than the red eyed vireos, uh, a little bit louder even in, in, to my ears at least. And let's listen to the yellow throated vireo. Um, and the yellow throated vireo has, uh, has a pretty raspy uh, voice. Um, I don't know if y'all ever watched The Simpsons, but the, uh, the Marge's sisters had really raspy voices. Uh, they were pretty heavy smokers and they, and they had uh, um, you know, raspy voices, um, kind of some harsh voices. And, and, and listen to the difference between um, you know, those, those first two that we listened to and the yellow-throated vireo, which is here too. So all three of these are here right now. So really loud. It's got a burriness to it. And let's listen to the red eye vireo one more time, okay, so you can hear the difference. So similar, right? So they all say vireo, um, but the blue headed slower, a little bit clearer. The red eyed vireo is really fast. And then the yellow throated vireo is, uh, it's, it's pretty quick too. Um, but it does have that real raspy uh, um, part to it. And uh, it, it'll, I mean, almost immediately, once you practice these, you'll, you'll know what that is just by ear. And if you've never seen one and you know what it sounds like, then you get to go, uh, then you get to go find it, right? Um, and I didn't even say the, my, my phrase to start everything off, but you won't see what you don't see, right? But you might see what you hear. So I, I can't stress enough how many more bird species you'll see if you learn their sounds. And this isn't something that I just, you know, I listen once and I pick it up. Um, I sit in bed sometimes. Um, my, my silly joke is uh, earbuds saved my marriage because one, one night I was just sitting there after many, many nights of doing the same thing, listening to bird sounds. And my wife just dropped some earbuds onto my chest and said, start using these. So. <laughs> So anyways, um, I practiced a lot, a lot, a lot. I can't stress that uh, enough. So don't get frustrated. Um, you know, I've, I practice hours and hours and hours to learn these. Not to say that I, that I know these, uh, it's because I love it and I love finding new bird species. And one of the best ways to find these beautiful, beautiful, beautiful birds is to learn their sound. Um, so if I'm looking over here to my left and there's a bird a hundred yards to my right that I hear and I know I've never seen it, guess which direction I'm going to go. I'm going to go to the right and go find that, that bird species that I've never seen. So learn these bird sounds and you'll, you'll see more bird species and you'll, uh, um, uh, you'll just enjoy it more, right? It's kind of, it's fun. Um, and then hey, we have- Jay, real yes, quick, there is a question. Um, do you know why the red eye vireo is called a red eye vireo? It has a red eye. All right. <laughs> it really does. Just like this one right here, the white eyed vireo. Um, you know, look at, look, at the, uh, look at the eye there. Um, so the pupils, um, obviously black, but uh, look, look around that and it's, it has the white. Um, so, uh, you know, um, the red eyed vireo is pretty hard to, to see the light has to, or, um, the eye at least, um, the light has to be perfect. Um, you have to be pretty close. Um, you know, so I've seen them captured. If you, if you look, if you Google red eyed vireo online, um, and just kind of focus on the eye in your search, um, you'll, you'll be able to find some good pictures of them and, and, uh, you'll be able to see what I'm talking about, but yeah, it's, it's appropriately named. All right. So. If there's no more questions, uh, we'll go over to the uh, white-eyed vireo, and the people that have taken my classes before have, have all heard me, uh, you know, talk about this one. But you know, we, we have to talk about this one every time, right? For those that don't know it, but uh, the mnemonic is "quick, give me the beer check," right? And that's how it sounds. So, quick, give me the beer check, and here we go. So, quick, give me the beer check. All right, so that's another vireo. Um, and if you're really lucky, you might get all four uh, vireo species uh, right now if you go out. Well, there are more 
uh, vireo species uh, out there. Um, typically, we don't we don't see too too many come through the the Midlands. May in the maybe in the upper state. I know the Philadelphia vireo will get in the fall time, especially. Um, but they're not really making too much noise in the in the fall time or uh, singing, obviously, since they're not breeding. Uh, but quick, give me the beer check is one of the one of the coolest uh, little mnemonics out there. It's a funky little sound that this uh, this great bird uh, makes. And if you've never seen this bird. Um, go to uh, any park around here. If you find a, a thick area, especially on the edge of a field, um, you know, you'll, you'll have a really good chance of seeing this bird. Um, and it's such a unique call uh, that even my two kids, I have a nine-year-old and, and five-year-old boy, and even my wife, who again, isn't, isn't really a birder, they're like, oh, is that that beer check bird? And I say, yep. And uh, I'll ask them what it is. And I, I think all three know that it's a white-eyed vireo. Um, so, uh, uh, again, unique call, really, really beautiful bird. These videos are really pretty. I don't think they get enough credit from the birding world, um, with how pretty that, that they are. Um, but, uh, all, all four of them are here right now. Um, we'll be left with three pretty soon as the, uh, blue headed video is going to go further north to breed, um, and out of South Carolina. Uh, so we'll get to some other birds here. And Jay, Greg wants to know how long the vireos will be around. So now you said we'll only have them for a little while longer. Yeah, well, the blue head of vireo will be gone uh, probably, you know, in the next week or two. Um, I'm, I'm sure most of them have already left, um, you know, for uh, their northern breeding territories. Um, but the, the other three um, that I'll click on again, uh, the red red eyed vireo, the blue headed vireo, and the yellow throated vireo, they're going to be here. Oh, I'm sorry. I said the blue headed vireo. The red eyed vireo, the yellow throated vireo, and the white eyed vireo, those birds will be here, um, you know, throughout the spring, throughout the summer, and then they'll, they'll head back to their wintering, um, their southern wintering range um, in the fall. Uh, so, probably September, October, um, you know. In some areas in South Carolina, uh, we do get the white-eyed vireo overwintering, especially once you get to the sand hills, once you start getting to the, uh, um, the Orangeburg area the, and then the, the coast, um, you're gonna get more white-eyed vireos. Uh, typically in the Piedmont, uh, we don't have any in the winter time, uh, but most of them are gonna leave South Carolina um, in the fall time to uh, winter in their, in their southern, southern homes, right? Awesome. And then yeah. a fun comment, John says that his wife insists that the white-eyed vireo sounds like R2-D2. <laughs> That's proof yeah. that everybody can hear something a little different. With absolutely, you. absolutely. Just like those young ladies uh, before, right? Um, so if that's, if, that's what, um, if that's the connection that you need to make in, in your head to uh, identify that bird, uh, you know, so be it. And that's a wonderful one. I think that's pretty cool. And your wife is pretty cool, John, apparently. Um, all right, so do you have any of these in your yard? Uh, you know, think about um, Shandon or, um, you know, Rosewood in Columbia. Um, they're old, old, older neighborhoods that have a lot of uh, thick shrubs, um, you know, some thickets, even with all those houses around. Uh, you're going to have quite a few brown thrashers right here, and, and the brown thrasher is, is one of our mimic birds. Um, you know, about, I think, two or three years ago, um, I was so excited. I thought there was a Chuck Will's widow in my yard at 9 a.m. in the morning, and I, and I told my wife, I, said, I had to go out, grab my binoculars, and on a dead pine tree, on a snag in my front yard, uh, was a brown thrasher mimicking a uh, Chuck Will's widow perfectly, perfectly. And I was wondering why in the world a, uh, uh, you know, a Chuck Will's widow would have been singing at 9 a.m., but um, it was a brown thrasher. So sometimes, you know, when you're burdened by ear, you might, you, you might think you hear something, uh, and then it turns out to be a, a bird that uh, was just uh, making that sound, right? Um, the northern mockingbird is going to be another another um, mimic bird, and then the gray cat bird. So, if you hear a brown thrasher sing, it usually sings in twos. Um, usually sings in, I guess, couplets. Um, so, say if I'm saying J J, um, it, so it's going to say J J Shannon Shannon. Um, whereas a mockingbird might go J J J J Shannon 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 Shannon, um, and then a uh, gray cat bird is going to just kind of go bananas with uh, how many times it repeats things. So uh, uh, the brown thrasher, in terms of how many times it repeats the phrase, it, it, it does it the, the least amount um, out of uh, 
out of the, the, the three mimic birds that we have. But then blue jays can, can mimic other birds um, and there might be, you know, one or two more out there. But these are the three, the, the three main ones that mimic are the brown thrasher, uh, mockingbird, and then the um, uh, gray catbird. And Jay, we've got a lot of people that have seen these brown thrashers in their yards. Um, yeah. That is probably the most common response. Yeah, great, great. Regional um, wood thrush as well. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I don't know if I have a picture of it. Then we have an oven bird that kind of looks similar. It's actually a warbler. Um, and uh, it's just a lot smaller. It kind of walks around like a chicken. And it's the one that does the crescendo um, teacher, teacher, teacher call. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, the wood thrush, uh, I know people see them in Columbia. That's not where they're really going to breed in Shandon or, you know, Rosewood, but you might see one in your yard for a, a few days maybe, uh, but then they're going to go to some pretty big forests. So typically when we hear a wood thrush, uh, we know that that ecosystem or that, that habitat is, is pretty darn good and healthy. Um, they're, they're what they call an indicator species of a, of a healthy uh, ecosystem or a habitat. So let's listen to these birds and um, let's listen to this brown thrasher do its uh, mimicking. So you hear the twos. Okay, I hope everybody picked up on the, the twos there, um, how, how many times it typically repeats the phrases. And here, let's listen to one of the prettiest sounds uh, that we have here in South Carolina this time of year and into the summer. And so uh, again, typically you're gonna find that wood thrush in pretty, pretty big forests. Um, so if, if, you, if you haven't heard one or haven't seen one, um, you know, maybe Saluda Shoals uh, might have some, um, Congaru Heritage Preserve I know has some, Watery River Heritage Preserve, they'll have some, uh, just big forests. Um, yeah, there was a place that I went up to in Little Mountain this past weekend and, and they had some, um, and it's called Rocky Branch um, Natural Trail. A small park, but had a lot of different birds there. Uh, but a lot of forest around it, there's a little mountain right there, and that's basically untouched um, uh, in terms of, you know, their forest. And they, uh, they, you know, there's a pretty good healthy population there, uh, based on what I heard at least. And then let's go to the yellow-billed cuckoo. And if, if you have large trees in, on your property, you have a lot of natives, natives are going to produce a lot of caterpillars this time of year. Just go out and start looking at leaves and look at all the caterpillars. Um, but the more natives you have, uh, the, the insects have evolved with those, those plants you know, that grew up here, uh, the more insects you're going to have on those. And then therefore you're going to have more birds just because you, you're providing more food for them right now. So uh, hopefully if you haven't seen this bird, yellow-billed cuckoo, y'all learn, uh, learn this call and um, you'll, you'll be able to find this bird this year if you try. Kind of a funny sounding bird, right? Um, gosh, there's, you know, it, it, it almost sounds like a barking dog or a, or, or a, a certain frog, um, but that bird's gonna stay relatively high in the trees. Um, you can see uh, it, it, it has uh, kind of a, a dove color to it. Um, it. It's got about the same length as a dove, um, but look at the real, real white underbelly. And then you can see this, these beautiful, beautiful white spots on this long tail. Uh, the flight is a lot different than a dove. Um, a dove has uh, kind of, you know, if you've ever seen a jet fighter, um, you know, an airplane fly in the air, uh, looks really just sleek. And that's kind of how a dove looks. Uh, the, the wings are kind of pointed backwards. The yellow-billed cuckoo, the wings are more, you know, outstretched and it flies real straight. So point A to point B, real straight. You watch a dove and it can curve and you know, it does all sorts of things, real athletic bird. Um, a yellow-billed cuckoo flies pretty darn straight, uh, not as fast as a, as a, as a morning dove. Um, and so, uh, so hopefully, you know, um, with, with those uh, clues there, um, hopefully you'll be able to see one if you haven't 
uh, yet this year. But uh, again, they, they stay pretty darn high in the trees. Uh, Brown Thrasher is going to stay pretty low. Um, uh, you know, I've, I've heard them calling or I've seen them calling or singing from trees in my yard this year, this spring, and they're probably 60 or 70 feet high. So obviously they're, they're singing. He's saying, hey, look at me. I'm healthy male. Um, and uh, let's start a family together. Uh, but typically we're going to see those those birds in the in the bushes and the shrubs a, a lot, uh, you know, sweeping their bill back and forth looking for looking for bugs in the in the leaf litter. Uh, the wood thrush is going to stay relatively low too. I'm not going to tell you they won't be 60 or 70 feet in the air, but uh, or in a tree. But typically they're going to be uh, pretty low. Um, so just some differences in in you know how they or or what they what they like in terms of uh, habitat. And we'll go to some blue birds now. Um, so there's a little mnemonic right there on the right hand side, and it's where, where, what, what, see it, see it. So where, where, what, what, see it, see it. So is this call for the indigo bunting, the eastern bluebird, or the blue grosbeak? So y'all um, let Shannon know what, what this is. So where, where, what, what, see it, see it. Is it A, the indigo bunting? Is it B, the Eastern Bluebird, or is it C, the Blue Grosbeak? Make sure you comment your answers in the, in the chat box. We haven't gotten any guesses just yet. <clears throat> We've got some A's. One B, but mostly people are going with A. All right, we got some birders uh, in the house right now. So, uh, so yeah, the call, the where, where, what, what, see it, see it. Um, that's the one that I always go, go, go with. Anyways, um, there's one. I think it's uh, fire, fire, where, where, uh, fire, fire, where, where, see it, see it. I think. Um, but you know, it also sings in twos, kind of like the indigo bunting, though it's not a you know a mimic bird. Uh, but where, where, what, what, see it, see it. And let's listen to that right now. Um, you can see there's some variation. It's not going to be perfect every single time. Um, it might just say, see it, see it sometimes. Um, but the, the point is to, to try to pick up on that, that the singing in twos a lot. And you saw, you heard that little trill at the end as well. Um, sometimes some um, American goldfinches, you know, can, can kind of sound similar to an indigo bunting. But if you're around a field, um, you know, with, with a lot of weeds, um, like think of, um, right aways you know power line right aways uh, and you hear the where where what what see it see it or just see it see it um uh yeah there's a good chance that there's a beautiful beautiful indigo bunting and you know up until about eight years ago nine years ago i had no idea that this gorgeous bird even lived in the united states uh, at least for part of its life um it was the second bird that i saw after the baltimore oriole that changed my life um that just kind of blew my mind. And I probably saw it about a week after I saw the Oriole. And I said, what in the world are these gorgeous birds doing in the United States, right? They look like they should be down in South America or Central America or something. Um, and they are, half of the year, but uh, then they then they uh, come back up here to to breed every single year. Uh, this bird is is everywhere. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a common bird. Uh, so if you haven't seen it, you will see it um, this year. If you go to the right habitat, Think about weedy fields, okay? Um, even some corn uh, farms, you know, some corn fields will, will have them in there. Um, you know, they, they only have that one species of plant, so it's not going to have a tremendous amount of food. So if you can go to a weedy, you know, kind of a prairie, natural prairie area, you're going to have a, a higher chance of, of seeing an indigo bunting. Um, a bluebird, let's listen to this. So a lot different than that indigo bunting, and let's listen to the blue grosbeak. That was a big jumble, right? Jumble, um, you know, jumbled up song. Uh, sounds like a DJ is just spinning records, is is how it kind of plays out in my mind. But let's let's continue to listen to the blue grosbeak. So a lot different than both of them, right?
So you have the indigo bunting that sings in, in twos. You've got the eastern bluebird that's relatively predictable and common and that's easy to study. And then all of a sudden you've got the blue grosbeak that just kind of spits it out there. And um, <laughs> it's just fast and, and furious. Uh, but it, that is something that you can get familiar with if, if you practice. Um, but beautiful, beautiful blue birds that we have. And I don't know if y'all are wondering why, you know, I included this prairie warbler um, on this on this slide, but the reason I included it is you will see these three birds, the eastern bluebird, the indigo bunting, and the blue grosbeak in the same area. Okay, you can see all three of them standing on the side of the road if you're in the right habitat. And that habitat again is, is basically a weedy field or a right of way, or even in um, you know, a, a pine forest with a, a clear understory, maybe with some grasses. Uh, but along with those birds, you might hear this prairie warbler. And in terms of sounds, it's one of the best uh, sounds that you'll hear out in the, out in the um, while you're birding. And let's listen to this prairie warbler. So it rises, right? Um, a northern perula, which is a type of warbler, um, it'll rise, but then it falls. It'll rise and then fall. Um, sometimes it'll rise without the fall, but there is some difference to its song. Um, it's typically not going to be in the same habitat as a prairie warbler, uh, but once you practice the, uh, the prairie's uh, song, it's kind of hard to, to misidentify it by ear. And if you've never seen one, um, I mean, that's how I saw my first one at Watery River Heritage Preserve. I was, I was riding with uh, two friends of mine and I told them to stop quickly on a dirt road and they were wondering what in the world I asked them to stop for. And I got out and we all saw uh, our first prairie warblers. Um, without hearing that bird, obviously, um, it would have taken me a little bit longer to, to find that bird. Um, so learn the sounds and you'll be able to see these, these great birds. Um, but Eastern Bluebird, Indigo Bunting, Blue Grosbeak, and Prairie Warbler. If you're lucky, you might see them in, in one stop in a certain habitat this year. Let's just quickly listen to the owl sounds and I'll give you some mnemonics to remember these. Uh, we'll start with, with one that you probably already know, the barred owl, and the mnemonic is, who cooks for you, who cooks for y'all? The kids love this one. We started going to, to schools this year and I, and I said that who cooks for you, who cooks for y'all and all the kids heard it and their eyes lit up and they thought that they had just figured out the, the hardest puzzle of all time. So who cooks for you, who cooks for y'all? So they're hopefully IDing those, those uh, owls at home now with their parents. And let's listen to the great horned owl. To me, the great horned owl's call is a lot better. It, 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 it sounds a lot richer, smoother. Uh, to me, the barred owl sounds like a trumpet or a trombone. The great horned owl so sounds like a uh, French horn. Um, if any of y'all were uh, cool like me and played a brass instrument back in the day. Um, so the great horned owl, uh, the mnemonic for that one is, who's asleep, me too. So who's asleep, me too. See if y'all can hear that. So who's asleep? Me too. All right, so a lot richer sounding, a um, little bit more muted, I guess, too, than the barred owl. And then the screech owl, you really can't confuse with anything else. It doesn't screech, it, uh, it has this whinny sound, like a horse. And then it also has a flatter, a flatter sound as well. So those are those are a few owls um, that we have here in South Carolina. Um, and uh, the barred owl, you know, breeds in a cavity. Uh, we just put one up at 14 Mile Creek this weekend. Um, and then the screech owl also breeds in a cavity. And uh, you know, the uh, screech owl is a species in decline. Um, and just by putting up a, a box, uh, you, can, you can help that owl out. Um, the great horn owl makes a, makes a large nest at a at pretty high um, area in the tree. Um, and if you're lucky, you'll, you'll find one of those nests. So, so some of our southern warblers, and I just say that just because the pine warbler kind of stays here uh, year round. Um, we see more in the wintertime because a lot of them come down here from northern states to winter. 
Um, and then the hooded warbler, which is which is here right now, um, it's kind of a, a southeastern um, warbler. Uh, it doesn't go super super high north to breed. Um, you know, maybe a little bit further north in the southeast, but um, you know, one of our southern warblers that we have here, um, it'll go down south, you know, out of South Carolina in the winter time. However, uh, but the pine warbler does stay here year round. Um, and this is one of the birds that this weekend we we heard with the with the kids that we were hanging out with was the uh, was the hooded warbler. Unfortunately, we didn't see it. Uh, would have loved to. Uh, would have loved to see seen the react reactions. But learn this song and find this bird if you haven't seen it. It is one of the prettiest birds out there. So hooded warbler. Here's the sound. So tui 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 to you. And I don't know if y'all heard that bird in the back there, in the background, but that was an oven bird. So it, it kind of crescendoed. Um, so uh, it's kind of fun to, to listen to these birds in the background of some of these, but let's listen to the hooded warbler again. So it sounds like there was a titmouse with that um, in, in there and uh, possibly it sounded like a black and white warbler, uh, which makes sense. Um, you know, if, if I'm hearing a hooded warbler, it uh, makes sense that I'm hearing an oven bird. It uh, makes sense that I'm hearing a black and white warbler. It makes sense that I'm hearing a uh, tufted titmouse. Um, and let's listen to the pine warbler. They don't sound anything alike, um, but I just kind of lumped them together because they are yellow and uh, they, uh, they are kind of uh, southern warblers. So you'll find these in mixed deciduous, you know, pine forests. You'll find them in pine forests. Uh, they're appropriately named, you know, the pine warbler. Um, if you don't have pine trees, you know, you'll have less less of a chance uh, finding them. Although you will you will see them, especially during migration. But if you have pine trees, you have the pine warbler. We'll listen to it one more time. A beautiful trill that you could get confused definitely with the chipping sparrow. Um, the chipping sparrow is a little bit, probably in my opinion, a little bit quicker, a little bit more metallic-y sounding, if that makes any sense. Um, but you can practice those those sounds and uh, um, you know figure out the differences there. Uh, now these are these are pretty tough. Um, there's the summer tanager in the top top right. That's one of the birds that the uh, young fella started IDing by, by with with his eyes this weekend after seeing them so many times. Um, and let's Jay, see. Real quick, we've yeah. got um, a question. Um, so it says pine warblers attracted by both longleaf and loblobby pines. Yeah, you'll see them in, in both habitats, no, no doubt about it. Yep. And Andrea did ask how you tell the difference between the pine warbler and the chipping sparrow. So, uh, so the pine, pine warbler is gonna sound a little uh, more melodic, okay, like it's a better singer, like it's had better training. Um, the Chipping Sparrow is gonna, gonna sound a little bit more metallic-y sounding. Um, again, I don't know if that makes any sense, um, but uh, you know, not as good of a, good of, good of a singer. Um, it, it, tip, typically it's pulses, you know, the, the trill is gonna be a little bit faster um, in general, you know, with a, with a Chipping Sparrow. Um, that, that chipping sparrow really sounds uh, a lot like a worm-eating warbler as well. I've played a chipping sparrow or a worm-eating warbler sound before and I had a chipping sparrow, you know, come out, you know, really upset because their, their calls are, are so, uh, so uh, similar. Um, all I can tell you, because uh, sometimes every now and then a chipping sparrow will fake me out. I'll, I'll think I'll, I'll have a, a pine warbler and it'll be a chipping sparrow. Um, so uh, all I can tell you is just just go out and practice and listen to them, and I'll give you some sources at the end of this um, to to find to where you can practice online or on your phone. Um, but practice and and don't be afraid to make mistakes. I mean, I I, I bird with PhDs, you know, I, I birded with people that have birded, you know, for 30, 40 years. Everybody makes mistakes. Those people make mistakes. It's okay. So make mistakes, learn from them, and uh, keep on making mistakes. Um, and these are uh, ones that you will make mistakes with. Um, so two tanagers here. You've got the scarlet tanager with that beautiful scarlet color and those and those black jet black wings. 
And you've got the summer tanager here, and then you've got the rose-breasted grosbeak at the bottom. Uh, all three of those birds are here in South Carolina right now. Uh, the summer tanager will breed um, all over South Carolina. The scarlet tanager, uh, the one on the left, uh, that's gonna mainly stay, let's think about Clemson, where Clemson is, um, the foothills, and then the mountains. Uh, that's where that one's gonna breed, but it will pass through all of South Carolina. Um, on its way to its breeding uh, grounds. And then the rose-breasted grosbeak, um, I don't think any of them breed in South Carolina. Could be wrong. They might breed in some of the mountain areas um, that we have here, but they will be passing through here. They're here right now, um, but they'll be here maybe for a couple weeks, two, three weeks, and then they'll, uh, they'll go further north. Um, but let's listen to these birds. And I lumped them together because they're very similar, but we'll talk about the differences. So let's start with the scarlet tanager. All right, so listen to how burry, okay, so how raspy that one is, all right? And let's jump to the rose-breasted grosbeak. So similar song, right? So similar song, but listen to how clear this rose-breasted grosbeak's song is. It doesn't have any of that burriness. It doesn't have any of that raspiness to it. It's similar to a uh, robin, no doubt about it, and I understand that. Uh, but it's even, you know, kind of a better singer than a than a robin. So let's continue listening to the rose-breasted. How about that? Um, and let's jump up to the summer tanager here. And again, we're gonna go back to the tanager's um, you know, raspiness. It is a little bit different than the scarlet tanager. So let's listen to this one. I would say, in my opinion, it's kind of in between the rose-breasted grosbeak and then the scarlet tanager. So it has a little bit of raspiness, but uh, not as much as the tanagers or I'm sorry, Scarlet Tanager. And if all of this is confusing, I get it. Um, practice, 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 practice. Go out, study, um, and just have fun, really. I mean, you're, you're birding, but as you're birding, um, you'll, you'll pick up on certain things that just click. Um, it's just like practicing baseball. All of a sudden, you can turn two after, you know, 100 times uh, uh, trying it. Um, but here's, here's two ways um, or two sounds that will definitely help you identify the scum, sarl, I'm sorry, summer tan, tanager um, from the scarlet tanager. So let's listen to this call, which I was playing while people were signing up uh, to get on this class. But here's the summer tanager's call. Okay, and then here's the scarlet tanager. It, it's, people say it sounds like chick burr, so chick burr, here we go. Chick burr. Okay, so even though the songs are kind of similar, their their calls are really different. So let's listen to the call one more time of the summer tanager. Okay, so hopefully hopefully that'll be helpful. And again, I'm going to give you uh, sources to to use to study these. And Jay, um, before we move on from that group, we had a question from John. He wants to know if you would throw um, a house fitch into this bunch as well. Oh, you know, I don't know. Um, I'd have to, I'd have to have it happen to me where I'm confused uh, with, with that one. Um, maybe. Um, I've been confused with a house finch before, um, you know, a few years back. I can't remember which species it was, uh, it was confusing me with, but um, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know if I would. Um, you know, there's definitely other ones. Even a vireo, uh, you know, can can kind of sound uh, a, a really fast singing uh, vireo can 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 kind of sound like like these birds here. So um, these are probably some of the most confusing that we'll talk about today. And all it takes is is just practice, just repetition. Um, but it wouldn't surprise me. You know, the the house finch, you know, has a pretty good um song and it's long and uh, i could see how someone could could think they're similar no doubt about it sure and then just so you know we've got about an eight minute left right. hour. 
All right, here, we'll, we'll kind of go through these. These are, uh, are quickly, these are some of our more common birds. And if you haven't seen a brown headed nuthatch, you, you do need pines and it doesn't matter if they're long or long leaf or live lolly. Um, if you have pine trees, you'll hopefully have some of these brown headed nuthatches, but they, they sound like a squeaky toy. Um, and that's a bird that, you know, I grew up with and never knew existed until about 10 years ago or nine years ago, whenever I started paying attention. But I do know, you know, I grew up with a lot of pine trees. They were all around. I just never knew that those cute little nuggets were, were crawling all over our pine trees in, in my parents' yard. Uh, here's a Carolina wren. Um, that's the one that I call the German because my, the word that I use is Germany. So Germany, Germany, Germany. Um, but that's the one that will also slow down and, and people use tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle. So it'll slow down. And that's also a bird that is breeding in Shannon's uh, yard, right? Or your porch, correct? That's correct. The <laughs> Carolina wren nest in our fern. So our fern is now mostly dead, but we have six baby Carolina ferns. And I'm going to put in the chat box our Instagram handle because I'm posting regular updates on those cute little Carolina Wren. So you can click over to our Instagram to, to see progress updates on them. If you want to see what kind of mama Shannon, Shannon is, you just uh, pay attention and, and keep up with us on Instagram. Um, and then the Eastern Toey um, is drink your tea. So see if you can hear that. And this was a big hit this weekend because there was a lot of Eastern Toeys around. The kids loved it. And it sounded like that every single time it seemed like. And there was a bird also in the background. I don't know if you heard it, and that was there this uh, this weekend as well. But it's a field sparrow. Um, so you know, just hearing those sounds kind of tells you what kind of habitat uh, you have. You're going to have some thickets around because that's what the the towhee likes, um, and then the field sparrow, you know, likes that as well. And there's going to be you know usually some edges around thickets like that. So there was there's plenty of uh, prairie area around those uh, around those thickets this weekend. So we'll go to the go ahead. We've got a question from yep. Courtney Hardy. She said she heard a bird singing. It sounded a lot like a toey with a fourth note, lower than the third. Um, if it sounded like a toey, you know, I would I would probably say it was a toey. Um, and you know, well, I'll go ahead and get through these slides right here, just in case somebody has to uh, to leave. But um, if you want to stay a little bit longer. Um, after the hour, um, we can we can try to figure that one out. But uh, if it sounded like a toey initially, it's it's probably a toey. So let's uh, let's talk about the painted bunning just a little bit. Um, I know there's a mnemonic out there somewhere for this one, and it has the word spaghetti in it, but I just <laughs> I just don't hear it. So um, you know, again, what for me, what I did to uh, learn this bird uh, song is just get out there, get out there and watch uh, Painted Bunning, which is pretty uh, amazing, um, and, uh, and just get familiar with it. So, you know, kind of similar to, I guess, uh, maybe a, a blue gross beacon, they would be in the, they would be in similar habitat. Um, but uh, again, there's ways to, I'm going to give you some tips to, uh, to learn, you know, these, these bird sounds, but uh, one of the ones that, it, that, that works for me is just getting out there and uh, getting out there for a good amount of time and just watching one bird species or a couple bird species at a time and really just spending some time with them to, to learn them. So a, co a couple buzzy um, warblers that we have coming through here right now, uh, black threaded blue, um, we, we get those pretty readily every single year. Um, black threaded green warblers, um, you know, I don't get them uh, a ton here in Chapin, but we do, we do get them. And if, uh, if you're lucky enough to hear both of them, um, you, you'll be able to kind of uh, learn the, the differences, but they both are, are kind of buzzy. So the black, the black threaded uh, blue warbler I'll play first. So zoo, zoo, z is a, is a word or a, a kind of a, the phrase that they use, zoo, zoo, z. Uh, 
and there was a wood thrush and a, and a hooded warbler singing with him. And then uh, the black throated green warbler right here. Let's play this one. So buzzy, but totally different, right? And then the blue, black throated green warbler also has this, this song. All right, kind of slowed it down a little bit. Um, but I learned those songs, uh, you know, a few years ago, three, four years ago, and I was just walking in the woods in the back of my yard and uh, heard the zoo z zoo zoo z, and I knew immediately that there was a black throated green warbler. I'd never seen one before. Was really excited to see one, and uh, really neat that uh, that we had one in in our yard. Um, but I, again, I would have never known that bird was there. Uh, you know, if it wasn't for its sound. So the uh, Prothonotary Warbler, um, Congaree Creek Heritage Preserve has a lot of these. I know some, some guys went out there this past weekend and, and had, I think, probably 10 or 12 of them. Uh, Congaree National Park has a lot of these. Uh, any place really um, that holds water in South Carolina during the breeding season that has a large forest around it um, might have these Prothonotary Warblers, but sweet, sweet, sweet is their uh, the simple mnemonic. Sweet, 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 sweet. All right, and let's go to the northern perula, a bird that's gonna be here, uh, well, right now, until probably September, October. And that's the one that I was kind of talking to you about whenever, when we were talking about the prairie warbler. So let me, let me go back real quick, real quick to the prairie warbler. All right, they both ascend, right? But let's listen to this perula again. A lot faster and then it drops off, okay? It doesn't have the drop every single time, but I think, I don't know, over 90% of the time. Um, uh, you know, it, it probably drops there at the end. It can slow it down, okay? It can slow its call down or song down, uh, but typically up and then down. Um, let's do it one more time. All right, and great crested flycatchers are here and they're here in pretty good numbers. It seems like I'm hearing them way more than I did last year and, and seeing them, so I'm happy about that. And then, um, so, you know, I could see sometimes people getting those confused uh, with certain, uh, certain calls that they make with maybe a red belly woodpecker, but they are uh, cavity nesters. Um, and so if you have a, if you have, uh, you know, uh, some, some mature trees <clears throat> in your neighborhood, uh, and you want to put one at the edge of your yard, um, and the trees, uh, you know, put it relatively high, uh, maybe over 10 feet, uh, around 12, 13, 14 feet, if you can. And, um, I think the hole needs to be about one and three quarters inches, you know, for the great crested flycatcher. And, uh, you could help that species out. Um, but I'm pretty sure that's another, uh, one of our species in decline. And then you have probably a, a bird that everybody is familiar with, uh, but the pileated woodpecker. You're probably not gonna get that one confused with anything. <laughs> so I'll just move on to the next one. All right, so uh, how can you hear more sounds in your yard? Um, you know, I'm not gonna ask you because everybody knows the, the answer to it, or I'm not gonna have an ABC on this one, but uh, which, which one do you think would, uh, would produce the, the least amount of birds? And obviously everybody would say the top right. Uh, yard, because it only has turf grass, and that turf grass looks pretty darn nice, right? Uh, so there's probably some herbicides going in there, some, probably some pesticides. Um, probably some things that, that the birds just don't like, and it's probably killing off a lot of the things that the birds eat. Uh, you might get a, be able to put a bluebird box up and, and attract a bluebird, maybe, 
Uh, but just uh, just imagine if uh, all those houses in this neighborhood, I would I think it's safe to assume, I guess you shouldn't assume, but I, I would put my money on it that most of the yards in the, that neighborhood probably look like this, okay? Um, so what if we could get to those people and say, hey, you know, let's, let's have a little bit extra texture to your yard. Let's have a little bit um, more elevation difference. So you see this turf grass and that's fine, right? Um, you could see a northern flicker eating in there, um, some bluebirds, some other, some other species, but what about this right here? You might have some grosbeaks, beaks, some indigo bunting, some American goldfinch, and then in these shrubs, you might find some yellow rump warblers, maybe some magnolia, well, I don't know about a magnolia warbler, but you know, a yellow warblers maybe. And then once you start getting up to, to the mid uh, canopy and then the upper canopy, you're gonna see, what if you see something really neat like a black Bernian warbler up here or, or a cerulean warbler? You know, all those different levels, all those different heights, uh, the, the height difference in, in these yards, this one here and then the one to the left, are, are gonna support more species. Um, and then when you start including native plants, you're gonna produce more insects and uh, you're gonna support these birds that are, you know, for the most part, they're all struggling. Um, so think about native plants. Think about the insects that you're, that you're providing these bugs, um, or bugs, uh, birds. You know, everybody thinks about uh, feeding birds seeds and that's fantastic, especially in the uh, winter time. But think about uh, feeding them insects uh, through, through the native plants. Um, so tips for birding by ear. Um, so I've, I've already told you all about practicing, practice, 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 okay? Um, if you want, uh, Merlin Bird ID is an app that I use. It's the first one that I, that I downloaded onto my phone. Um, so that's the one that I use, it's the one that I'm comfortable with and it's, and it's been great for me. Uh, Audubon has a, has a really good one as well. Um, but there's, there's other ones out there as well, but Merlin Bird ID is the one that I use, um, all about birds.org if you're on your computer or an iPad, um, you can go there. They, uh, it's, I think it's owned by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Um, so they use the same pictures, the same sounds, but the all about birds.org is going to have a lot more information on it, um, than, than their app, um, more of the natural history of, of the bird and all these cool, you know, facts about the birds. Uh, learn those mnemonics. They work for me. They work for a lot of people. Some people can't hear them, but uh, you know they 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 do work. So uh, learn learn mnemonics. Some some of them are published out there for you to read, and then others you know are hidden in your head somewhere. You just have to pull them out. Um, and maybe just learn ten new bird songs this spring, or you know uh, find ten birds that you really really want to see and learn those learn those songs, and then go out and find those birds. Uh, you know, it, it helps to find out what kind of habitat those birds like, and allaboutbirds.org can help you out with that. Uh, use eBird to see what birds are in your area. If you're wanting to find a rosette spoonbill and you're in the mountains, guess what you're not going to find? A rosette spoonbill. So if you go on eBird, um, you can see what birds are in your area that week or that month. So um, if you're wanting to see a blue wing warbler and you know that, you know, in, in Seneca, uh, they're there in, in, you know, the last two weeks of April, um, you know, guess when you should uh, go out and find the, the blue wing warbler up there. Uh, you, eBird can really help you become a better birder um, and uh, help you uh, see these, these fascinating creatures, right? Um, pay attention to the habitat you're in. I think I just, you know, kind of talked about that. Um, and which birds could we could find there. So think about the blue birds that we were talking about before and that prairie warbler. Uh, you pretty much have to go to their habitat to see their bir those birds. Um, so learn the habitats um, that these birds like and you'll, you'll see more birds that way. So we'll kind of end um, you know, the sound portion with, with these two. And you can see visually, the Chuckwill's widow is a little bit more rufous. He's got that uh, kind of reddish brown to it. Um, but the, but the, the calls are a little bit different too. So Chuck Will's Widow. All right, and let's play the Whippoorwill now, a little bit faster. Uh, but those birds are here right now. Um, and all these pictures uh, and the sounds that I, or most of them were uh, obtained from allaboutbirds.org or Merlin Bird ID. Um, 
And this is, uh, you know, we're doing what, uh, what we're supposed to be doing here at, at South Carolina Wildlife Federation. We're, we're educating. Um, and I love this quote that I recently found. <clears throat> um, it says, in the end, we will conserve only what we love. We will love only what we understand. And we will understand only what we are taught. So um, I'm, uh, hopefully you, you learned something today. Um, and hopefully uh, you'll fall in love with something today. Because if you do, you're going to become a conservationist. I'm for I'm sure most of you are already, um, but you know, for us to do this, we, we need y'all support. Um, for, for me to take kids out, like you see at the top, top left, uh, I, I, I do get paid, believe it or not. Um, and uh, we can't do that, I can't do that without your support. Shannon can't do her job without your support. Sarah can't do her job without your support. Um, you know, help us, help us reach more kids uh, next year uh, once, we, once we can go back to the schools. Um, you know, we, we were probably going to reach about six or 700 kids this year. I'd like to reach a couple thousand, um, you know, going forward each year and maybe even more. Um, these folks down here at the bottom left, they're uh, friends of mine. Um, we have a doctor in there. We have a state farm agent and we have an IT rep. We have a military guy and a, and a, and a really talented builder there. They have never heard of a prothonotary prothonotary warbler ever in their life until I got them to build boxes with me. We built 50 and I was able to distribute and install with DNR um, on some great prothonotary warbler habitat. Um, we can't do this without you guys. Um, we have the website right here, www.scwf.org, if you want to donate to us. And then if you have any questions, we've got the phone number right there. And if you have any bird questions or habitat questions, um, how to enhance your property and your yard, you know, for wildlife, uh, feel free to, to send me an email personally. Um, and Jay, and on that note, um, if you wouldn't mind popping back over to slide 15 with the habitat, would you mind sharing some of the other ways that some of these birds, you know, other than just loss of habitat might, um, that these birds might be in decline? Uh, sure. Well, you know, climate change or Right. So, you know, with, with climate change, um, think about a bird that's coming up here and it's, it's been coming here for, you know, thousands and thousands of years in March. And it, during that month, uh, something was blooming. Um, and say with climate change that that starts blooming in February, but the bird's still coming in March, that there's, there's kind of a reduction in that, in that food source for uh, some, of these, some of these birds and, and other creatures as well, uh, other wildlife as well. So, uh, you know, read up about it. It's, it's interesting and, um, you know, the, it might prompt you to, to, to kind of do something. Um, think about window strikes. Um, you know, millions, if not, you know, a billion birds die each year because of window strikes. Um, think about uh, domestic cats that are outside. Um, I mean, the estimate is uh, one to three billion birds, over three billion um, birds die each year because of uh, domestic cats that are outside. Um, and then you also have uh, tower strikes. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, uh, these birds have so many challenges out there and, and there's no, no surprise that, uh, you know, they are in decline. Um, but, you know, doing, doing simple things like this, um, enhancing your property for wildlife can really, really, really make a big difference. Um, and, and hopefully you'll, you'll be, um, uh, hopefully you're being encouraged to do that to your yard. And uh, again, please reach out to me if you, if you have any questions about it. So we actually, I asked the question in the chat box, how many people had their backyards or wildlife habitat friendly. And we had a lot of people tell us that their yards were certified. So that's great. Awesome. It looks like we've got a number of questions. Let me scroll up and make sure I get all of them. Thank you for staying late. Um, let's see. I will be sending out the slides. Um, they'll be coming as a PDF. So you won't actually have the sound links. Those do live mostly on Jay's computer, but we'll give you information on how to get sound um, access to bird sounds. Um, let's see, does anyone know how the prothonotary warbler got that name? So there's a clerk in the Catholic church um, and uh, I guess, let's see, he might be called a prothonotary, but he, but he wears a, uh, a robe that is about the same color as the prothonotary warbler. So that's, that's how it uh, got its name. And you can read that probably all about birds 
.org or somewhere in Audubon might have that uh, listed or, or written about there. But um, yeah, I know it has something to do with a Pavel clerk. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, it's like Karen just ordered some birds and beans coffee on our recommendation. So that's yes. All birds right. and beans coffee. We sell it in the office when we're open to the public, which we're not really currently <laughs> open to the public. But right. And if you want to sign up um, for our coffee club, um, again, it's a little tricky with with everything that's going on. Um, you know, sign up for the coffee club. You can email me about it. Um, and the, the shipping is a lot, is a lot less when it's, it's bulk ordered and it's shipped to our office and you can pick it up. Um, and, uh, you know, the more people that are drinking this hundred percent shade grown coffee, the, the better off the birds are going to be. So please consider it, uh, birds and beans coffee. Um, and, uh, if you have any questions about it, please reach out to me. So it looks like right now. A lot of great comments. Um, Mary Beth said that they're great horned owl nests in their osprey nests. Oh, wow, that's awesome. I'd like to see that. Send us a picture. And Greg, um, Greg wants to know about the upcoming status of live birding classes. So um, again, we're just kind of following government recommendation on some of these classes. Um, so we don't have any scheduled at the moment as soon as our staff and our board feel like it's safe for us to get those scheduled for in person, we will get those on the website. So be sure to check our website. We are going to be adding um, some additional webinars, um, just like this one. We will do some repeats because we've had great interest in the sign up. So um, we will be sure to keep those updated on our website, scwf.org slash events. Mm. Courtney wants to know if anybody has ever spotted painted buntings in the upstate. Yeah, they, they spot them from time to time. I, I, I've seen a picture of one in Asheville, but you know, those birds, <clears throat> those birds are just passing through, um, you know, during migration and, uh, you know, migration's happening right now. So, you know, I haven't seen one in Chapin. We're, we're a little above, uh, like the town of Lexington, we're barely in Lexington County. Um, but we're, we're probably just a hair too far. And I'm just talking about a sliver too far north uh, to really have them breeding here. But once you get to the south side of Lake Murray, you know, into Lexington and into the Sand Hills, um, you're gonna see more and more. So yeah, you'll see them in the upper state from time to time, uh, but those birds are, are passing through. If you ever have one that is actually breeding, you, you see the painted bunting and, and the, the females all green, and you see them, uh, you know, going to a nest. Uh, you should, you should probably call us or Audubon. That would be really neat to, to, you know, record. Um, but typically, they're going to stay about middle of the state, down to the coast. Let's see. I think that's pretty much it for questions so far. Does anybody else have any last questions before we log off and end the webinar? Courtney's got one more, it looks like. I'll just wait on her to finish typing. Okay. Blue grosbeak, how do you attract it? Well, did you see that picture with the, uh, <laughs> the grass like that? Um, you know, they're not gonna, they're not gonna like this. Okay. But they will like this. If you're talking about attracting them, they will come to a feeder during migration. Um, but if you have, you know, the grass that they like, um, and I, I, I'm hesitant to use the word weeds because a lot of, a lot of people think, you know, weeds are bad. Right. But, um, if you have this, uh, the, the you know, the, the weediness, the prairie, you know, type of look to your yard, you'll have a better chance, um, at attracting those blue gross beaks to your, to your property. Um, I don't know how bit larger your property is, but, um, you know, keep the feeders up. You know, I, I usually keep, mine up until about you know the first couple of weeks in May and then I take them down um, but the more all I can tell you is the more uh, native plants you plant the more caterpillars you'll have the more caterpillars you have the more birds you'll have including the blue gross beak the indigo bunting all, all sorts of things that are you know going to be passing through um, you know uh, areas that might not be the ideal breeding habitat but as long as there's food there you know you, you might have a chance to catch them uh, passing through your pro property. Looks like that might be it for questions.
All right. Well, this was super fun for me and I appreciate y'all's time and your questions and, uh, you know, just, just, uh, kind of going through this long presentation with me. Um, and, and hopefully, you know, if, if we can't do it by the summertime, hopefully by the fall time, I might see you guys out on a in-person walk. And Scott just said, um, if we want to make a thank you donation, how is that best done? Thank you, Scott. Um, I will put the link in the chat box, like Jay mentioned at the end of the slideshow. Um, if you want to make a donation to support our work, we don't just do education classes. We also have a lobbyist. We work on um, numerous projects to restore habitat, tons of education classes. Um, you can make a donation at our website at scwf.org. Thank you for that question. And thank you, Jay, for this presentation. <laughs> And if you have any questions, you know, that you think of afterwards, just feel free to uh, email either SCWF or, um, or just me directly. But if I uh, email SCWF, you'll just, uh, Shannon will forward those emails to me. Very good. Well, thank you so much, everybody. And um, we will see you for the next class later this right. week. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.